Welcome at the Growcast, the podcast of Blue City and Blue City Lab, in which we talk with age Rotterdam based pioneering bio designers, our so called pioneers, about how a future will look like if we design with nature as our guideline. We started this podcast to celebrate the opening of Blue City Lab, a biocircular playground for pioneers located in the heart of Blue City. We invited four frontrunners whose work will make us rethink everything we think we know, and four aspiring bio designers who want to challenge the status quo. My name is Barbara Vos. And I'm Emma van der Leest. In this podcast, we welcome fashion designer Ilva Siebenhaar of Studio Ilva Siebenhaar and textile designer Laura Lugman of Studio Kuka. Together they started Living Color, a sustainable alternative to artificial textile dyes made from bacteria. A great success. They just started the collaboration with sports brand Puma. Welcome, both of you, Laura and Ilfa. We're very glad you made it in these um, yeah, bizarre times during uh, the current crisis we're facing. And before we kick off, let's start with a personal question. How were the last couple of months for you too? Of course, there are many projects that were being postponed or took place in another form because we were working towards a very big exhibition in Milan during Milan Design Week uh, with Puma. But uh, of course, Milan Design Week was postponed and then it was completely cancelled for this year. So the exhibition never happened. So we had a, a digital virtual exhibition instead. So that was a very big shame. And there are still other projects as well that have exhibitions that also don't take place. So the design week, for example, now is completely virtual. So yeah, those are the biggest impacts for us. For the people who don't know you, what do you do? Yes, we dye textiles with pigment producing bacteria. And we do that to create an alternative to the current hazardous textile dyes because they use a lot of chemicals, very bad for the people who work with it, but also for the environment, causes a lot of pollution. And we are searching for an alternative that requires no chemicals at all and uses lower dye temperatures and less water. And um, that's why we work with pigment producing bacteria because you can grow them on top of textiles and they dye the textiles at the same time. But how, how does it work exactly. So a, a bunch of bacteria in a Petri dish, you place them on textiles or? Yes, that's how we started. That's how you started? Yes, yes. And we started in these really small Petri dishes um, with little swatches of textile and we put the textile in a liquid nutrient medium and then we added the bacteria and then we like let them grow for three days and after three days the textile is colored. Okay. And so it's a uh, so it doesn't happen in your lab with the two of you because you're actually working with this big, big brand, Puma. So can you tell something about that? Yeah, um, probably the, they also know us about uh, the bright, vivid colors, um, which are very, very typical that we are using, like the violet purple, for example, and the, the project with Puma. Uh, we developed this uh, with Puma Innovation Team and we were able to work in a laboratory of uh, the University of Applied Science in Rotterdam. So that's really um, um, the main, um, how do you say, uh, the collaboration part. Uh, we are with these three, type, uh, three uh, companies. So you have like Puma, Living Color, and then um, University of Applied Science in Rotterdam. So it's not uh, because uh, when you start telling me this, it sounds like a very it sounds like the future, but it's actually happening right now. Yes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's still on a very small scale because we still work in the lab in like yeah in the normal lab in very small still petri dishes we build ourselves or we we grow them a little bit uh, bigger, but um, it's still very artisanal and all hand labor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because in the future we hope to dye like the big textile rolls with this exactly with yes. these bacteria, of course. So now you can only do small garments in homemade petri dishes, which are which sometimes are like one and a half meter or so, yeah, <laughs> or something like that, for a yeah. pair of jeans. So, and uh, can you tell us on how nature inspires your work? Um, yeah, I think nature, to me, um, it has like all the solutions 
for the world where we are living at the moment. So um, I think if you are taking a close look in how things are work in nature, you can use it as an example and to use it for your own design strategies. Um, can be anything basically. Um, it's just the way how you are looking, uh, how your vision is and how you can adapt it in your designs. Yeah, I also think that there's still so much we don't know about nature. And also, I'm really fascinated by microorganisms or anything you can put under a microscope and see what happens there. And there are a lot of microorganisms that haven't been discovered yet, so we don't know the, the potential that's still out there. And it's so beautiful that these microorganisms were the first like living things in the world, and they will also like live long after we have maybe uh, as a human species uh, gone, been gone. So it's really cool to have these tiny little creatures that we cannot even see with the naked eye that has so much potential in all kinds of industries, not, even, not only textile dyeing. I think that's really interesting but because you don't wake up and just think, I'm going to work with bacteria to dye uh, garments. But how, how did you get that idea, that inspiration, and actually made it into a prototype? Um, I first got to know pigment producing bacteria at a course at the Waag Society in Amsterdam uh, called Textile Academy. That's also where I met Ilfa. And um, yeah, they had a workshop where we could experiment with pigment producing bacteria on textiles. And I was so fascinated by it. I would, yeah, I wanted to research it f further. And then. Yeah, because it's not a new thing, right? It's been um, going on for well, years. Yeah, it's, if you look at the first patterns for a pigment from bacteria to use as a color, it stems from, the, I think, the early 80s. You two are working individually, but also working together uh, on this project. Can you tell us how that happened, but most of all, how is that working in practice? How it happened? Yeah, we met each other yeah. at the course at Waag Society, so that was kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, we were both interested in the bacteria dyes because it was also such appealing to our eyes. It was it was beautiful purple uh, color, and um, we were both from Rotterdam, and we were traveling like once a week or two times a week to uh, Amsterdam, and then we were talking about all the projects. And then at the end, we needed to um, uh, work together, or you could work together uh, in an exhibition, and then we decided to to make a project out of it. So that was in 2016, yeah, right? Don't, don't forget to talk oh, in the microphone. Was, yeah. That was in 2016. And well, now it's 2020 and we are still uh, working together because, yeah. And you're still laughing. We cannot, People can't hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we cannot stop uh, with this project because, um, yeah, it develops more and more. And every time we have some new questions, it opens also... Um, place for other questions so and and is it because we're talking about inks and more sustainable inks um is it actually dangerous to work with with living material like like these bacteria in the lab and um especially you work on fashion is this less harmless than inks we use of course it is yes but working with bacteria is also you know not without any risks. Yeah, that's true. We work with bacteria that aren't um, harmful in the sense that you can get sick, but it's not a probiotic, so you cannot ingest them and eat them, or for example, even also the pigments. But um, in the lab, it's safe to work with it, but of course you have to take this lab protocol into account and have very good safety measures, because working with bacteria could also... Uh, also uh, potentially be dangerous, even if the bacteria are fairly harmful. Yeah, but the yeah. lab provides you with the good uh, yes. prevention. Yeah, uh, we don't have a scientific background, so working in a lab was the first for us, but they taught us everything we need to know to have uh, yeah, lab safety. Yeah, and, and also um, uh, the garments afterwards, because it's, mm -hmm. it's in direct contact of the with skin. With the skin, yeah. yeah so How's that working out for you guys? Um, well, we have tested it on ourselves. We have worn it and we don't get any rashes or something. But that's something actually that we really want to investigate and have tested because we want to make sure 
Um, you have to know that synthetic dyes we use in clothing today are never tested for allergies, for example, but they cause allergies. Not all of them, but some do. And um, they also contain chemicals, of course, yeah. which could be harmful. And the bacteria dyes we work with in our process, we don't use any chemicals, but still we want to know if the pigment itself could cause some kind of allergy or maybe has some toxins in it that could be... because. Uh, it's natural, but natural doesn't mean you cannot get sick from it, for example. Or Are there any uh, law and regulations for this? Textiles are just tested for chemicals and that's it. So, oh. yeah, even if you want to dye textiles with plants, it's not to say that plants are always safe to dye textiles with. So, but that stuff doesn't get tested. I still think we need to address something because both of you are really like focused on sustainability, but still... Uh, you choose to work in, I think, one of the most not sustainable industries in the world because, uh, well, of course, we've talked about chemicals, but it's water consumption, carbon dioxide emissions, textile waste, and uh, not even um, not mentioning the big um, pink elephant in the room, human rights, when it mm -hmm. comes to this industry. So how do you manage to, to stay to your ideals in this fast fashion industry? I think like one of the main reasons is to be a sustainable designer is, is that we have lots of examples how to do it not in that kind of way. So that's also like, um, that inspires me uh, as a designer to do it differently. So that will also keep me, keep me going and, uh, found, find searching and finding new solutions. Um, for the harmful industry where we are working it because working in because um it's our passion and you want to do it right um so yeah and thus uh, a collaboration with puma uh, because it's it's a big brand you know it's 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 one of the biggest and uh, working with them on this level and on and talking about this subject do you think do you feel that there's changing something in the the industry as well Yes, it certainly is, but it's going very slow. Um, I think especially these big brands that are very, yeah, that have a lot of responsibility for the problems in the industry. They should be like really front leaders and put in more of the money, but more efforts to, yeah, pay living wages, for example. I think that's one of the biggest problems at the moment. I think if you fix that problem, the, all the other problems like pollution and stuff will resolve itself because people have more money to take care of their environment and their business and yeah. And have you also mentioned during the collaboration with Puma that um, you really catalyzed something? That they really, of course they started to work with you, but now after this collaboration of course Unfortunately, not an exhibition yet, but how do you reflect on, on the collaboration and um, the outcomes of it? So do you really see that they want to move forward with this? Yes, they have very good sustainability goals within their company and they're working on it and they have reached their uh, like tasks or what goals? Do you say goals, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but of course, there's still so many steps to take. Yeah. And we worked with the innovation department, which is not responsible for actual sales. So they are really into like innovations. They're really interested in biodesign. And so they want to invest in these kind of small scale um, innovations like we have to propose an, a new future, but also to really integrate it into their business model in the future. That's really what they want. Yeah. And, is it, and is it possible to like dye the, the whole collection of Puma uh, at in the a moment, natural way, yeah, with bacteria? Not yet. I I think like the possibilities are there, and it's 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 uh, basically that you need to scale the processes up. But I want to also add something about the whole Puma uh, innovation part. Is I think it's very good if a company has kind of an innovation um, part in the company because. Um, that part can show and prove to the other, like the business part, uh, the business unit of the company can prove how things are working and that things needed to change. So I can imagine it's very difficult for a company just to, to start dyeing textiles uh, with, with bacteria and then um, 
suddenly not dyeing the textiles on the, um, on, the, on the way that it's been done nowadays. It's a very big step to do that. But with these innovation um, teams in the company, they can prove that it's working and yeah. then they can implement it step by step into the whole company. Yeah, exactly. Are they willing to implement it? Because what we've seen in the sustainability world, of course, that the greenwashing is an important topic. Yeah. And then... So they, they use like a very small skill and to showcase that it works, but then in the end they don't, uh, how do you say, implement it in, 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 in the whole system. So it just stays like this little show pony, the, mm -hmm. this tip of the iceberg, but the rest of it isn't changing at all. Well, well um, the plan the, was really to implement it, yeah. but then COVID happened, of course. Oh, really? and Yeah, and what the thing is, most of these companies... Um, these innovations are mainly paid from a marketing budget. Yeah. And that's the first budget that's... Right, that's a big challenge. Right, uh, <laughs> yes. When, when, when a crisis like this happens, marketing is the least important within a company. So that's the first budget that's really cut. So, um, well, yeah, companies have to... Um, they want out. to make money, right? Yeah. yeah, and they have to survive. And they need to survive, that, I yeah. think that's one of the main yeah. problems with COVID because at one hand you see, well, we have this great like reset and every company is looking at, okay, we have to change everything, we have to do things more sustainable, but then the money um, is a big problem at yeah. the moment. So I'm really afraid that all these sustainable initiatives... Um, that everyone is so because excited of about more, yeah. because of COVID, it will take even longer. Recently, I heard that an average woman has more than 150 garments in their closet. That's a lot. That's an a lot. average woman? Yes. In, well, I think the Western world then. Yeah, I think so. But <laughs> yeah. I was really shocked. And then replacing it, I don't know, every, every season. How do you s foresee that with, with your technology and your garments? Do you see it as a... Also a statement, maybe? Or? Yeah, we also have like a vision on that because um, some of the bacteria, they are um, fading over time. And what we were thinking uh, is you can dye the, the textiles in seasons. So you can layer the dyes, uh, for example, like in um, spring, summer, you have more lighter colors. And then during the autumn and winter, you are dyeing the same textiles. Um, in more um, uh, more darker colors. And then after a while, the, these colors will fade away and then spring, summer is coming oh. and then you are going That's to really dye your textiles again. Season proof. Exactly. <laughs> and if you have like really good quality garments, you can wear them basically whole year and also layer them. For example, I'm wearing a um, silk... Um, silk shirt at the moment, just with some cotton under it. But in summer, I can wear this as well. And then only with, a, with, with, with my bra under it, for example. The dye is one thing, but also the, the textile you're using it to dye is a, another thing that has impact on the sustainable or on the footprint of the garment, so to say. So do you also make or buy specific textiles or what to use and what not to use? Do you make a, a difference in that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, we like silk very much, but of course silk is not a really sustainable fabric um, in the production part. When you buy it and you wear it, then it's very sustainable, but not in why? the production part. People uh, maybe ask why? Um, well, it, the process of silk is very uh, labor intensive, but also very water intensive for the bushes, uh, the yeah. mulberry bushes to grow. Um, but we, if we use silk, then we choose the pea silk. That's the silk where the silk worms are not killed in the process because normally the silk cocoons are boiled and with a worm inside and then the worm got, uh, yeah, will not survive, of course. Um, but the, with pea silk, they open up the cocoons first, take out the silk worm that can turn into a butterfly or a moth, and then they unwind the silk. If you tell that story, then... It's not, uh, it's not as scary anymore. Good. Well, um, and of course, you're not doing this alone because you, you work with partners, you work with scientists, with the experts that really you know, help you to make this, make this project great. Um, how important is it for you to work with scientists besides 
the lab uh, part? Um, can you answer the question? <laughs> I think it's a little bit difficult. <laughs> Yeah, of course, because we don't have a scientific background, you cannot work with bacteria or living organisms if you don't have a scientific background. So you need to have these uh, collaborations, but not just because we don't have the knowledge, but also because I think scientists and designers really think the same, but the way they work is completely different. So I think designers also question the world around them. We experiment a lot. Um, but scientists like really test everything. So, um, well, they see also all the possibilities and future possibilities, but, but they seek proof. And that, of course, we as designers do not. We, we create a world, uh, we create a vision, um, but it does, isn't necessarily scientifically proven. So that collaboration, I think, is very key, and I think it will happen a lot more in the future. So I'm very, very proud to introduce our special guest uh, for this interview. She holds a PhD in plant science, biochemistry, and is head lecturer and researcher at Biology and Medical Laboratory Research of Rotterdam University of Applied Science. Welcome, uh, Dr. Barbara Schermeijer. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Thank you. So, so just to keep on going because it's it's it's, it's uh, a mouthful really, yeah no but it's also very important i think to mention oh. because you're working right now on a this multi and interdisciplinary project that's called the valorization of residual flows from agri and horticulture to stimulate a bio-based and circular economy mm -hmm. and since 2018 you're doing the research on pigment producing bacteria so we heard about it uh, just now for applications in the textile industry in collaboration with these two pioneers here mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it's, it sounds like a perfect match. <laughs> it is a perfect yeah. match. <laughs> so how did you two meet and how, how did you start collaborating? Because I don't think it's like a shopping mall in which you can easily find each other, but how did it go? Well, I have to say that already Ilva mentioned that during her uh, internship, uh, when she was studying at the Willem de Koning Academy, she already started to contact us and she got in collaboration with one of my, um, my colleagues, Jan de Jong, and she set up an, an, an experimental design in our lab. And um, since then, um, they did several things uh, on their own, eh? starting uh, all together uh, Living Color, working also together with the Wageningen University. And then they uh, start contacting us again. So us is then biology and medical research, uh, laboratory research. And, um, and actually they got in contact with me because as you mentioned, I'm, um, I have or sort of coordinating a, a huge project um, on valorization of residual flows. I, I'm, it's not that I'm only doing yeah. that myself, but maybe, we do maybe a Maybe you can explain a little bit what that is. I will. Um, so in horticulture culture, you have a lot of waste flows. So for instance, if you have uh, flowers, still a lot of flowers are not sold every day. So there is a waste flow. And plants are full with very valuable uh, compounds, as we call it. So it is a pity that a lot of these waste flows are really waste flows, so in yeah. the linear economy. And we would like to look at it as a residual flow and to get all these valuable compounds out of it and look for new applications, uh, for instance, in the textile industry. So um, when Ilfa and Laura uh, got in contact with us again in 2018, we we had a meeting in, in, in my room, I think, yeah, it was in my room. And it was the first time I saw Laura and Ilfa and it was an, uh, uh, yeah. An instant match. Yeah, yes. definitely. <laughs> totally. yes. Yeah, I think I, we can even talk about friends, right? Yeah, it's a really, really good uh, connection. And it's like finding like-minded people, I think. That's, yeah. uh, that's yeah. like the instant yeah. connection yeah. that you feel yeah. like, oh, we're working yeah. on the same topic. Absolutely. And for me, it is not only as a researcher, of course, important yeah. um, to, to, to have this collaboration, but as a, a teacher, as a lecturer, it is uh, Living Color, the project, is such a good project uh, for students to work on. 
And, um, as is, it, is it also because it's so visual, because they make you... Absolutely. Yeah. So it is one of the most wanted projects <laughs> <laughs> for students to select. <laughs> so it is sometimes that. really that, they have, that we have to disappoint students that, that they could not collaborate, uh, let's say, in the first semester of their study year. And then they really hope they can get involved in the second semester. And uh, no, it's indeed. So also when they finish their semester and doing research, we they have to present a poster or they have to make a, a video. And their posters are always so colorful, <laughs> even decorated, decorated <laughs> with, with uh, color dyed uh, uh, all kind of fabric. So it attracts really students to, to find out what is going on and it gives a totally new perspective of uh, on applied science in microbiology. When I, as a student, also collaborated with yeah. your department yeah. back in 2014, yeah. um, I do remember that, that when I asked the students, what do you want to become after your graduation? Yeah. And then a lot of students were more focused on analyzing experiments at the Erasmus University or hospital next door. Um, and I was really surprised because I thought you can do so much more. So I also think now it really turned the, um, the vision of your students by having designers in-house who also show how much scientists we need to uh, accelerate the field of biodesign and biofabrication so that they not only end up, <laughs> so to say, at Erasmus Hospital, but also really help to, uh, yeah, catalyze this uh, this whole new field. It's Absolutely. very funny that you yeah. say that because Ilfa and I gave a, a guest lecture once for the for the students, and we asked them at the beginning of the lecture, who of you would want to become a fashion designer after their studies? No one, of course, raised their hand. But after we gave the guest <laughs> lecture, we asked the question again, and some of them were like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's really cool. It opens their perspective of, of yeah. what's possible within their work field. And the last, in the last three years, I think, also recently last week, I got an email from a student who studied biology who wants to study design now. Uh, wow. So it's the other way around, which, I, which made me very happy. <laughs> um, so I think it's really good to see um, yeah, at the university that biology and design and the intersection becomes yeah, more popular, so to say, but also very necessary. Yeah. And why not? Because we have on one hand the Institute of Appli Engineering and Applied Science, yeah, where I'm, I'm working at, but we have the Willem de Koning Academy which is also part of the Rotterdam University of Applied Science. And the fact that we, you have biodesign and we have on our hand, of course, the microbiology that can be used in, uh, in biodesign. And chemistry, of course. And the chemistry, of yeah. course. And the, uh, but more than that, also industrial product design. We have the economic field. We have the log logistic part. So why not work all together? Yeah. That's, of course, also implemented in this multidisciplinary project I'm working on. And it is so nice now that also, um, I think two weeks ago, um, uh, Laura um, yeah, gave a presentation to my, my colleagues of the different fields within the Rotterdam University to, to introduce their Living Color project. And already from the economic uh, part, they, uh, they, they say, okay, we can collaborate with you guys and, and, and look at new business models, etc. So, yeah, that is the best. Why isn't it happening or why didn't it happen before so why is the, what's the challenge of the multidisciplinary uh, teams working with each other yeah first of all that that we have uh, um, we get let's say the insight of that it uh, will bring research much more further if you collaborate for yeah. instance on the circular and bio-based economy uh, for rotterdam university of applied science circular economy is one of their main yeah pillar pillars and um, if you then um, meet each other at certain uh, moments, then you realize that you actually all do research or have projects on this bio-based and or circular economy. And why not just start working together and exchange knowledge and exchange skills and make, make multi or even interdisciplinary project groups mm -hmm. of students so that they 
can answer each other's questions and even start sort of yeah. talking their languages. And is that changing? Definitely. Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely. But I also yeah. can imagine that bringing together different industries, in, uh, sorry, um, yeah, educations and also locations of the univers University of Rotterdam is a really big challenge, right? Absolutely. And but you, I must yeah. say, I'm very happy with Blue yeah. City. So we, we, we look for the collaboration uh, with Blue City, which was, of course, via you, Emma, and via uh, Laura and Ilfa, that we now have actually a, a circular, as we call it, a circular hub in Blue City. And we have this very nice, beautiful laboratory uh, uh, that is almost finished in Blue City. And um, this is now a, a place where we meet with students, where we have our work discussions, and they, they come in an environment that can, for some, be so very much expiring. And, and also for startups that are working here, in uh, that are situated here in Blue City, that they can find us, that they can find the students. And then when they have questions that we may can implement it as a project, as a research project, and, and that we yeah. can help each other. Because I think a lot of a lot of things has changed in a good way. Uh, if you look back, let's say for me, six years ago, when it was really difficult. So I think the role of education is really, really important. Uh, because, you know, at art school you don't learn about microbiology. Of course, you have to look for it yourself. But having a place or somebody who can help and coach you with that and is open to work with you, like like you, Barbara, uh, you see the value of, of a designer and also a collaboration with one of your students. So I think we need more people like you as well to open up and help us with those collaborations mm -hmm. because it starts with education, how do you foresee the future of biodesign and your work? And I want all three of you to answer this. Um, yeah, I think we already talked a little bit about this. I think it will start um, already in in the, in the by teaching it to the students because they are the future. And if they are very aware of their surroundings and how they can be a, a biodesigner or yeah, I think that's where it's all start. It will start in the in the classrooms and and make people enthusiastic about it um, on a very um, low. How do you say Low key. Yeah, yeah low key. on a very low low key manner. Yeah. I think so. And for you, Laura, I think by design is so much potential that I really see a future where production facilities look like breweries. <laughs> so um, not just beer breweries or something, but where you brew color or other materials for building or, yeah, me, yeah. I think you always, <laughs> Emma, have a good example in your presentations of what the Rotterdam Harbor, harbor would look like uh, in a yeah, couple of years. So, so if <laughs> anybody from the harbor company is listening, <laughs> I tell you in 10 years, the harbor is completely changed into a big bio facility where we ferment like, colors like Laura and Ilfa are doing, but also food, um, alternative letters, you name it, every, everything you can think of, we can actually create. And the beautiful thing is, that is real, is that we can change the facilities built back in the 50s and 60s now um, in a way that we can also produce these new technologies. So we can reuse our installations. So that's, that's of course, that will happen, right? We yeah. Will, we will... True. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. <laughs> We're very positive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Barbara, what's... Uh... How I foresee yeah. the future? Well, first of all, I, uh, of course, I uh, would like to uh, to keep on going in, in continuation, uh, the research I'm already doing, uh, but also expand that to the other fields, like the economic field and the logistic part and, and so on. Um, one other really challenge for me and, and big goal I have is that we can uh, make a combination between the valorization of uh, residual flows from the agri and horticulture to get uh, uh, yeah to make let's say new biofabrics out of that, um, and then that we can dye it with pigments produced by bacteria. 
Very good idea. <laughs> That's what I hope for the near future. So how can we yeah, move forward to, to, to implementation? So um, we've had many, many listeners from, from different industries today. And maybe you can give us a short pitch of what you need uh, and more specific who you need to move forward. So what is the next step? You've had this great collaboration with Puma, which is already a very big achievement, I think, but you want more. Um, so if you have a yeah a pitch for our listeners, um, so do you need a specific, a specific person or company or you name it to, uh, to take the next step? Yes, because the b bacterial pigments contain all kinds of antimicrobial qualities. Yes. So we would want to know if these qualities stay in the fabric after you dye them or wash them. So you could get uh, antibacterial fabrics, for example. But also we want to test if there are things in the pigment that could cause allergies, for example. So really textile testing, yeah. the proof that you have a safe product that you can sell. And, and can you wash it in, in a normal washing machine? Yes, yes. We have already <laughs> have those tests done. So we Great. know it's very color fast when you wash it. Because yeah, yeah. I think that's a question a lot of yeah. listeners have at yeah. this moment. You know, can I wash it? Yeah, is yeah. it like garment? the same? Uh, yeah. yeah, so if anybody is listening who uh, can help them out, please uh, contact them or us um, to make this uh, happen. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the end. Um, I, I learned a lot. Yeah, me too. <laughs> New things. So a great, sh yeah, big shout out to, uh, to you and a big thank you, uh, Laura, Ilfa and Barbara for being with us here today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you very thank much. You for us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you so much. This Growcast was hosted by Barbara Vos and Emma van der Leest and produced by Blue City Lab. This podcast was realized with funding from the Municipality of Rotterdam and Creative Industries Fund NL and was edited by Puree Productions. We also want to give a shout out to Nienke Binnendijk, director of Blue City Lab, and Sabine Biesheuvel, director of Blue City, and actually everyone else from the Blue City team for their trust and never-ending support. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>